All right, guys, how you like that title for troll bait? You had to click on it to find out what's going on. Well, welcome to the almost middle of February. Um, and tomorrow is Valentine's Day. And believe you me, um, by the time this episode is over, you're going to love me more than everybody else does. And you don't need to be afraid to admit it. It's a common thing in modern society. And then, come Monday... After I pick all this stuff off the floor, rented lips, um, it is Presence Day, and I want you all to pay attention to Honest Abe. You all need to be thankful and give a minute to what Honest Abe did for this country. And I'm talking to you, son. Get something in my eye. It's a tear. Believe that or not. All right. In this episode, we're going to be working on this airline that I got from... An artist who wanted me to do some work on it. We are going to be putting a pit guard on it. Now I gave you an episode. I wore myself out on an episode about a pit guard, how to make one. It's right up there. And the episode after that was about making your own brackets to fit on uh, to mount the pit guard because these harmonies and K's and whatever you may have, even though they're all made by the same dude in one factory, have a plethora of different hole locations to put on the pit guard but we're going to be working on this so we're going to call you know i invent words most in fact most of the human language in english or some variations thereof since 1960 were actually created by me ken that's right so we're going to come up with a new term called the diving board and we're going to call that the end of the fretboard that extends over the body. Now, why is it a diving board? Well, diving boards, you can jump up and down on, and one end is springy. Let me tell you a story. Here, I'm going to put this guitar away because I don't want you distracted from the profoundness that's going to come right out of here. I was about seven years old. Somebody took me to swimming lessons. Somebody was smart enough to say, hey, don't just throw him in the pool and see if he's going to drown. There were easier ways to kill me without the public seeing it. You know what I'm saying? My parents were very smart. So anyway, who do they hire to be the, 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 the coaches or babysitters, whatever you want to call them, at swim lessons? That's right, kids that are about 15 years old. So what did they do? They decided to reinvent the game of baseball without paying attention to the world's greatest Dodger, Billie Jean King, what she would do. And so they wrap up their tennis shoes in a towel, and they got a Frisbee, and they're trying to play baseball. So we see an opportunity to be the hero. We, in our probably second lesson, did not know how to swim. We went over to the high dive, not the low dive, not the middle dive, not the mid-intermediate level dive the high dive we climbed up there these people are oblivious to a bunch of little kids like ants at least three of us going up there the ones that became world leaders the rest of them i don't know what happened to them uh, i hope you're doing well in your mediocrity but anyway we we go up there and i was the second one off and that is the worst thing in my life i was not the first one off i usually am anyway we didn't know how to swim and I almost drowned it that day. And think about what your life would have been like had I drowned it that day. That is my profound high dive diving board story. So back to reality, I want to talk about why I'm calling this a diving board. Now, you can see air under there. You see it? You see my eyes? I'm looking at you. I'm watching you. Except at the end, there's a little piece of something. But there's a lot of air right there. That is not supposed to be there. So we're going to get into some mechanical engineer, engin, engineeringness, and we're going to use the smart pencil, the rocket science pencil. And I'm going to show you what's wrong with that before you buy one. Um, because there's always a crossroads you come to when you're going to buy a guitar. Anything with an F-hole is pretty. You know that. And so you're looking at this guitar, and you're overwhelmed. And you're like, oh man, I'm going to outdo Ken. You know what? Dodger Stadium is full of those people that are trying to do that now. That's right. Billy Jean will tell you that. But I'm going to outdo Ken and I'm going to do one of these. Well, 
the diving board area here is a bad scary place if you don't know what you're looking at so that's what this episode is about is a diving board but anyway back to the crossroads the matchbook of the episode is Rita's Crossroads that's right Rita's Crossroads at BR942 that's the phone number pick up your phone right now BR942 Rita's Crossroads they got everything there including no common sense okay a um, a new feature of the program is the Barrel House Words Word of the Episode a Blues Derelict Dictionary Dare Die whatever anyway let's get right on to the word the word is kick it kick it oh I'll skip that part and move right to the expression means to socialize let's stick with that one this is a family channel I can't believe you wrote that in there Stefan Colt really dude all right what else have we got here um oh I'm gonna do a shout out to a couple of my viewers um, first off Randy Moore uh, about your inquiry and Randy Moore no hell no and yeah I know and you know what guys Randy Moore when it comes to Randy Moore you know that thing that circle with the thing through it like the say no to drugs thing yeah say no to Randy Moore just just say no right away and uh, unless you're Randy Moore's wife then you can say yes God bless you woman but Randy Moore no do not covet my ribs I just made I knew there was a little bit left okay before I do my last subscriber shout out I want to do a resource and we'll give you a link below to a resource yeah and that resource is this this is a string winder this thing is awesome it goes forward and back I've got a lot of unstringing to do on this episode and this thing will save your wrist um, I know uh, wrist problems are pretty severe and commonplace in this country and I something tells me that most of y'all had one of your wrists shot by the time you were 15 years old oh yeah I was the only one right no don't lie to yourself and besides that don't worry about me worry about yourself no not like that regular anyway Ernie Ball string winder there will be a link below you got to have one of these finally we're almost there I want to give a shout out to subscriber Steve Maddox Steve Maddox from Dallas Georgia yeah because if you were from Dallas Texas I wouldn't even be saying hello to you because Texas was a bad place for me do you know what it's like to be the only blonde-headed dude in the state of Texas. I do, because I worked at oil fields there. Because I was. That's right. So, anyway, it was miserable. You had half the people running after you, squealing like a bunch of fangirls, and then the rest of them wanted to kill you. Yeah, that's what it was like for me. I can't help it. I was just born this way. Nothing I can do. Anyway, Steve wrote to me and said, you know what, the Camacho boxes are hard to find. Oh yeah, Steve, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's almost impossible to find these things. And I'm starting to get paranoid because I'm running low myself. People don't, just don't, all right? There's other things you're going to go there for. Don't blame me. Do not covet my stuff. All right, Steve. Here's what's going to happen. It is time for me to get that check the box on the do something nice for humanity that one time a year. Guess what, son? You're it. Uh, you and me are going to be in conversation. And once that's over, you're going to know what it's like to be coveted like I'm coveted. Anyway, you PM me as soon as you see this episode. Steve Maddox, Dallas, Georgia, Georgia, jo Ray Charles, do not covet me, dude, really. Okay, get your popcorn, sit down, put me on the big screen, get ready to be 
completely and utterly dismayed as we dive into the structural dynamics of our new term, the diving board of fingerboards. Let's go. I don't have to go anywhere. I'm already here. So let's go. All right, guys. This is the guitar I'm going to be working on. You've seen the artist uh, play on my channel, and I'll leave it at that. Um, looked at it. Uh, they asked me, can you do some things to it, like put a put a pit guard on it. And I already referenced, um, if you look at the eye, right about there, where am I? There it is, right about there, right about now. That eye that's popping up there will get you to the playlist on how to do uh, a pit guard and the brackets. This one's got a hole right here. So it mounts to, the pit guard mounts directly here um, and not over here. And then there's a hole over here and one right there. So this is an airline. I have one like it. You know the Bob Log guitar. You've seen it. But airline was made by Kay from Montgomery Ward. So you would have seen this in the hardware store around Christmas time. Now, while I got it up on the bench, we can kind of take a look. I started looking at this guitar and going, hey, you know what? I want you to look real close right here. Do you see that there is a fret marker right there? And then there are two right here. In what world do you have a guitar with a fret marker on the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the 13th fret, and right up here? And you see there's some discoloration here. This has been off of here at some point, And I'm not sure why. But let me show you a little trick here. Let's say that my neck is cut loose. Okay. And let's say I want to do what they call a hippie neck reset. If I were to take this saw right here, you all know these flush cut saws, and I were to cut right here down to about right there, what would be the result? Well, the result would be I would have a gap between the neck and the body, the thickness of this saw are slightly larger. Now, as long as I didn't cut all the way through, if I were to take a screw or something and flatten this area out and screw a screw in there and then countersink it and hide it in there and run that screw all the way into the front block of the guitar that's underneath here where all this mounts to, the V or the dovetail or whatever there would be destroyed, but it would give me a gap. And when I run this in, what would happen is the neck would tilt back okay so if there's a gap I'll make sure that I'm in the camera if there's a gap right here and I pull this back and screw in here without knocking the camera all over and pull this down that is going to take care of a high fingerboard so when I put my strings on after this it will sink in and it won't bow up because the neck is not bowing up like this and pulling against here. Now, the problem with that is this. There is supposed to be something underneath there. And if there's not, what ends up happening is if this is floating like that. You see that all that air in there? Can you see it? All that air right there. If it's floating, what ends up happening is all the stress goes either here or in the case of this somebody put a block at the end of it to catch all that stress to stop this fingerboard from coming down like a diving board that's what I'm talking about the diving board if this were not here what would happen is when the neck tries to flex if it's not supported here and all the way back here the stress is going to pick up right back here whatever regardless of what you did so that gap is not supposed to be there. Let's look at a couple of guitars and see what it's supposed to look like and 
there are different levels of thickness of fretboard and what's underneath the fretboard. So ha let's have a look at a couple other guitars. All right, this one here is a no-name guitar. It uh, is fairly old. Look, one of the one of the uh, tuning buttons came off. That's going to necessitate me putting uh, new tuners on it. But if you look at the back of this guitar and you feel the neck, it's got that, that V shape. So it's older than it looks. And those tuners kind of attest to that. But the issues with this guitar is, you see that? It's got a crack there. It had one back here. You can see where that's been repaired. Body's coming loose a little bit. Uh, crack right there. Um, it's been cracked right there. And there's been some rookie repairs on this kind I would make because I'm a rookie. But the neck appears to be fairly solid here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up using a piece of maybe this Patron box and making a couple little spurs because these cracks will tend to run unless you stop them by putting this here. And that involves some fancy work with some earthquake wax and a piece of wire and a mirror and a light going down through the F hole and placing it up here where you can see when you pull this crack up right there high enough to see what you're doing in there. You follow me there? Anyway, so let's get back to the diving board on this one. Look, there is no diving board. The fretboard goes right to the top of the body. Do you see that? Okay. Problem with that is this does not allow you to get the string height high enough to put this pickup on here that I'm going to use to hot rod this up. You see me using these pickups. There's one on Gallia Volts license plate guitar. You saw it uh, ultimately on the uh, Archcraft arch top is what I put on. I painted it or whatever. There's an episode or a playlist up there. The Archcraft arch top start to finish those repairs. But I'm going to put this under here like so in order to clear that I'm going to get to there. So I don't need that fingerboard to come up. So why is this fingerboard like this? We'll think this out. Also while I'm here, look at this floating bridge and then look at the one that I'm going to use here. You see how short that is? Let's get over here in the camera. See how short that is? Like so, there we go. If I put this one on here, this one is massive in comparison. So I have to use this little short floating bridge to get this up. Now, see how high the strings are? They're going to need to be that high up here. Uh, they're okay up here. And um, you can tell where people have been playing it. You ever see streaks on a, on a guitar? Like up here where people have been playing it that are very pronounced. Let me show you some. Like this one here. You're really going to covet this one. Look at those marks under. You know what those are from? Yeah, fingernails. They are from fingernails. Did you know that? Glad I could help you out, brother. So anyway, this is going to be hot rotted up. It's going to have a California theme. Uh, there's going to be a pit guard on here. There's going to be matchbooks. There's going to be stuff. Uh, California plates are... The old ones are black and, and gold, um, and it will scream. But the moral of the story is I'm going to make sure that the neck is reinforced here so I don't have to worry about it anymore. This is not a high-dollar guitar. So back to this. Why is there nothing underneath here? This was a student instrument. This was a very cheap instrument. There's no binding. Um, and when you bought a kid a guitar, they're not going to be sitting over here playing Eddie Van Halen doing this kind of stuff. They're just going to be strumming. It's okay that the strings were above uh, uh, the fingerboard like that. It was not a high dollar instrument. So, when you see this, chances are nothing's been done to it. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So, don't get freaked out. But understand, this will never be a high dollar instrument, even 100 years later. All right. Let's look at something else and see how it's supposed to be. This is a harmony. It doesn't have a truss rod. It's got a rod in it. We're going to call this the manicurist specialist because this person needs to see a manicurist. It is a H1214 manufactured in the second half of 1960. Now look here. 
what can we see? Oh, the fingerboard is a lot taller because there's a piece of wood under it and there's no gap there. Just one at the end and you can see that it's beveled. Do you see that right there? There's a little bevel. What are those holes from? And why is there a hole? Right there. In the side bottom of the guitar. Why is that? Alright, so here's why. You see this? It's a pickup that mounts on the side of a neck. This is an old Gretsch pickup. And um, I don't want to scratch it. And you have to be careful with this. But it's got... Uh, the poles and, and magnets stick below. You see that? You want to be careful with that because that will come up and scratch this, which is why I always keep this cork around and it sticks down. So but this cork takes up space and all that kind of thing. But anyway, what was meant to happen is this mounts to the neck and you can bend these out a little bit or a trim in here but what I like about this guitar is somebody had it wired up they didn't drill any holes in it anywhere so they probably ran a, a volume control if there was one up here uh, through there um, but there were no holes in the neck anywhere so that's good they use this I can appreciate someone who wants to make something one way or another and then uh, can make it go back. The one thing I do want to show you here is that you can see that you see those holes there and you see that is off. Those holes say that this trapeze was not always the same one that's on here. There wouldn't be four holes there if there was. So, but again, this is a nice guitar. Um, it's definitely not a student model and that is why there is no fretboard running right down to the top of the guitar and it's a little bit higher. This one is a little bit easier to put strings on and I want you to notice that if the neck is reset or something happens and you string this up with heavy strings, the momentum pulling it back is not going to be so much if this is supported right here because again that neck block is going to come back into here down inside the guitar you always drill your hole to, to steam these things off about the 14th fret. There's no indication that there's ever been the fret, fret board has been taken off or modified or anything like that. So uh, that is really the difference. So one more time, let me dig this other one up and not bust everything up. But I'll lay the student guitar over the top of this one. And you can see that this here only the depth of the fretboard right to the body and here there's more wood underneath there but there's no gap or airspace except on this one right at the end where it tapers up and that's meant to happen because this actually curves down here and curves down into here you're going to find that there's a concave on these guitars where at least most of them where the fingerboard comes into the body I'm making sure I don't lose guitars there's a ton of them here anyway so that is the way it's supposed to look all right you are going to see this one in an episode called comb over do over right about there right about now and I showed it to you the day that Tammy and I went out and picked it up and she strummed it or whatever but it had this set up for a bridge I'm sorry but that is not a, a stock K uh, or Harmony bridge it's got a comb underneath it it might be good to play the comb but it's certainly not part of it so we start taking a look at this one oh yeah this is a K this is a nice guitar but we start taking a look at this one and look what we got there you see how the neck it's starting to cut loose down here okay right there see that gap if you look in there I can see a V I don't see a dovetail so this is a little bit different setup um, and there's a gap right there see that gap so 
I also see something else that's very telltale. I don't know if you can see it there. Let me get this right. Let's turn it over so you can see it. But there is a spot of glue right there on the fingerboard. Right there is a spot of glue. Somebody has done some work on this fingerboard. So I think the neck was cut and loose. They couldn't keep uh, the original fingerboard because it would have been far too high. When the neck starts cutting loose and pulling back this way, the strings get very high. People start trying to trim down this and, and trying to go from this to there. Okay, take a straight edge off of the frets. You see there? It certainly would not be here. I'm going to come up a little bit off the press, but in order for this to work, that's not the way this is supposed to be. So this neck has been worked on. It's very telltale. Now, let's say somebody did what they called the hippie neck set that I talked to you about right here. Okay. Again, we cut this get the width of the saw here like this it's going to give us a nice big gap we bolt through here all the way in I'm going to show you a trick later on in an episode about how to bolt and not use a screw uh, but you bolt this in and that's going to pull this down um, but when you string this up look at how much air is underneath there see that that's going to let this bow itself down and you're going to have the same problem over and over this part needs to be supported. Again, you'll see this one in an episode called Comb Over, Do Over. All right, so we're back to the airline I'm going to work on. And um, let's look at this one more time, okay? Look at all that air underneath there. You see all that air? But look at that. Where's my pointer? Right there. That's handy. That stops the neck from pitching back. We've already done some work on here. Somebody, you can tell, somebody did the work. Um, they didn't put a bolt in it right there yet. So they won't have to do that. Um, it doesn't look like anybody's moved this up. That's something else, some, some, uh, something else other people will do. They'll cut the neck uh, pretty much completely off and then move it up. And then put another piece of wood under there, and that gets your uh, donkey going in the background. Isn't that nice? That's, the, I guess, the president of Acton there in the background. But I'll put another piece of wood underneath here, and that temporarily solves your problem. But you've cut the neck off, and now you're going to put bolts on it, and you've taken away the structural integrity of the neck and how it was designed. Now we're getting way off into uh, hope and pray world. But anyway, so what is wrong with that setup right there. This isn't allowing anything to, to bow down the back of the neck uh, or the neck bowing this way can't happen because that's, that's at the end. Well, it's called load isolation. Any of y'all that know that I work in palm trees and, and in the world where I talk normal and lose this fake Texas accent and start talking about the structural dynamics of palm stems. If you want to read that, send it to me. Load isolation is your worst thing. Load isolation on a crane boom will cause it to fold up or a radio tower. There are all kinds of calculations that go with guying down things so you don't isolate load. When you isolate load like this, what happens is all the pressure goes right there and you're going to crack there and there. So, what's the problem? Well, think about this. If I had an elephant stand on one part of a board that was this big okay and I put all the load right there versus the elephant's weight being distributed over the entire this so let's imagine a, a, a miniature elephant a microscopic ele elephant if that's helping you you know what I need to get the rocket science pencil out of the smart bin over there that that one but I put a dot right here and I'm going to magnify all the load that's going to go across this neck of the strings because we're going to put heavy strings on it there. Would you not rather have the load pushing down on this much rather than this much? This is common sense engineering. That's why I understand it. So here's what we do.
we've got some pieces of fretboard cutoffs, okay, from cigar box guitars. Uh, look, four string guitar. So I cut that much off to put this on a license plate or something like that. And it's as wide as that. And that would look, work really good right underneath there. So I'll just cut this off. I'll find out where that gap starts, which is right there. And then I know it ends right here. So I've got a mark here and here. And I'll just cut this off. And then I will take the strings off. And then I will jack this up somehow and push on underneath it knock that piece out and then just pull that up and wedge it there well no guess what you can't do that because this is concaved right here it's fairly flat up here and starts rising up to here and it's also concave down coming into there so i know i'll just take a piece of paper and put my pencil like this and and draw like this up to here that's really not going to do anything for us let me show you a trick okay so concave this way concave this way concave this way why is this important well anywhere that you isolate load like this if this is higher than here or there or whatever if it's not smooth and transitional then what ends up happening is you end up with cracks in this and you don't want that so how do we trace this out and find out what we need well we'll use the next stand and this piece of paper if I can get my pencil right in here it's easy for me just to trace that like so easy money but in the situation where I cannot get my pencil down in here and flat or whatever there's another way to do this and we'll do this with a Patron box because mysteriously that is about the size of shim that we're going to need to put under there we could also use cork material because we're not looking at prying this up. We're just looking at making it not being able to relax down. So I cannot get my pencil where I need it there. So again, I'm going to use this as an example here. Okay. Watch this trick. If I can't get my pencil down, but I can get it right here. All I would do is put a washer here. This is a washer off of a volume pot that I just dropped on the floor. Cut. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to squeeze this together. I'm going to put the washer like so. I'm going to put my pencil in the washer right there and push down a little bit. And look, that allows me to go along and follow the concave and, and surface of whatever it is I'm working on. And it gives me exactly what I need when I can't get my pencil down in here. So I would simply mask this off. One of these, this side is going to be flat. So I just basically tape this off, put this here, take this washer, lay it on here. And as I roll along with the pencil, it will follow the concave. And then I mark off where it needs to end. And I can basically lay that against the side, that pattern against the side of a fingerboard like so and take it to a belt sander which is concave and has a surface that um, not concave but curved has a radius and basically if I do that here like so and go to the other side and do the same thing as my pencil marks disappear from where I've drawn them out like this whatever the curvature is on both sides and I can feel it even down in here then it will slide right in here and support the whole thing I might tack it with a tad bit of double-sided tape or even a spot of high glue here and here and here and here uh, and then if I have to heat it up with a heat gun of course I protect everything here last thing I want to tell you is if you use this kind of tape on a surface like this sometimes if it's hot you'll pull this off and you'll see your varnish is gone so Get some low tack tape. Sometimes it comes in a color that's white. Even when you're using binding tape, watch out for that. But this is a pretty easy fix. That little washer trick is pretty handy. So to cut to the chase, you can see all that air underneath there. You can see that little piece right there supporting all of that with all that air gap. So simple question is this. Would you rather have 
the end of the fingerboard with all of the stress that's going with big heavy strings that these things need. Would you rather have it supported evenly by something that's been shaped to fit underneath there so the load di distribution is even or would you rather just take this little piece of a fret cut off and stick it under there and call it a day and then wonder why this all of a sudden starts running splits right down here or worse yet it caves in right there and cracks the whole thing so one last time you might see that on a cheaper student instrument you might see this on a little bit better instrument see there's no gap underneath there fretboard is there wood underneath there supporting everything but when you see this something ain't right and then it doesn't take too long to start looking around and find oh there's frets marks in the wrong spot there are this fingerboard has been filed up here at the ends but not down here the frets yeah this is trouble you're never going to get your money out of this one so you might as well just put a pick up in it and take it to Troy Murrah all right so there it is isn't it funny how something so small can give you such huge problems later when you're looking at a, a top that's cracked or your neck is starting to cut loose here and you think about that little piece of wood right there would have stopped all that so i hope you look at the guitars you're buying before you buy them um you know the things about the binding offsets and you know this looking a little bit high right here and that kind of thing those are all indicators of neck work has been done and if you don't equalize what's happened with your neck the first time you string it up with heavy strings and it starts pulling up this way and there's nothing there to evenly support it this neck's going to cut loose and it's going to break and you're going to be sad so end this episode for me by giving me a like subscribe if you haven't and I appreciate you watching and throwing your life away on my journey with cheap guitars that cost $16 at the onset. See you later.